Hello everyone, welcome to Sahitya Academy's Webline Literature Series. Today's program is in English language and uh, today we are going to discuss about translation in India. Uh, basically, we are going to the topic, the theme is uh, the role of translation in acquisition of knowledge. And uh, this particular aspect of translation, dimension, facet of translation is highly underplayed. Although they, if uh, one goes through human history, the greatest works, the immortal works, most impactful works, like if you take uh, the field of science and technology, the Principia of Newton, the works of Einstein, or when we come to the field of literature, like Kalidasa's works, Tirukkural from South, or Shankaradeva, all have been, have reached other uh, cultures through translation. Translation has got a very special role in yeah, multilingual society like India. Without translation, uh, it is not possible to survive in India. And uh, given this kind of importance, relevance of translation in India, how translation and translators are faring, that's another theme that we will touch upon. And uh, also that uh, the translation widens the horizon the sociological role which translation um, plays and how it widens the one's knowledge itself. That is another thing we will talk, touch upon. Of course, we have many more other topics to discuss. To discuss these topics and more, we have a very, very, very distinguished panel. The first panelist is uh, uh, Dr. Bikram Keshari Das. He was a formerly a professor of linguistics and English language teaching at Central Institute of English and Foreign Languages, CFL in Hyderabad. And he was a visiting professor at National University of Singapore. He is a prolific translator uh, of literary works from Odia to English. And was awarded the first ever, in fact, he was the first ever awardee of Sahitya Academy Prize for Translation in 1989 for his translation of Gopinath Mohanty's uh, novel, Raja. He's recently translated Gopinath Mohanty's Harijan, and uh, because of uh, COVID pandemic, uh, we may see uh, uh, the, uh, the book may come out probably uh, in early 2021. So welcome to the show, sir. It's a great to have in this Pleasure to have you here. Okay. Uh, this, uh, is the another, the second panelist is uh, yes, Professor uh, uh, Surabhi Banerjee. She's an author, translator, literary yeah, critic who writes both in English and Bengali. She has authored several books on various aspects of English, European, and Bengali literature. Professor Banerjee has translated uh, many Bengali books uh, into English and several French works in Bengali. Her uh, name has been included in Who's Who of Indian Writing. And uh, <clears throat> she has been a founding vice chancellor of two state universities in Bengal, one is Central University, a government of India, and in Odisha for nearly 15 years. Prior to that, she taught at Presidency College and Calcutta University as a professor of English literature and pro vice chancellor. Uh, she has uh, been twice a yeah, Charles Wallace Trust Fellow. Uh, British Council in the British Centre for Library Translation in the University of Anglia, Norwich, United Kingdom. It's a great to have you here with us, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah. Our next panel is Mini Krishnan, and uh, she has edited uh, literary translations for Macmillan India, Oxford University Press, and she has served on the National Translation Mission and the Indian Literature Abroad Initiatives. Presently, uh, she's coordinating a program of Tamil English translations for the Tamil Nadu government, uh, working with multiple publishers, Orion Black Swan, Oxford University Press, Penguin India, Hopper Collins, uh, Niyogi Books, and Ratna Books. She has co-authored and edited books for translation education in universities and colleges. Welcome to the show, Ms. Minik. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, our next person, uh, next panelist is Professor Dev Shankar Naveen. Uh, he's a professor at Center of uh, Indian Languages, uh, School of Language, Literature and Culture Studies, Jawaharlal University. He's a poet, critic, 
fiction writer, academician, and translator. He has about uh, 300 publications to his credit. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, and uh, he actually, he has worked in multiple institutions. Out of his 14 written for 24 editor and translators, translated books in Maithili and Hindi, published by many reputed uh, pub publishers. Uh, that very important ones are Raj Kamal Choudhury, Jeevan or Srijan, Anuvad Adhyayan Ka Paridrishya, Akhtar Kamba, Bharat Ka Prashin Itihas, etc. Sir, welcome to the show, sir. Thank you very much for joining us such a short notice. Thank you. Thank you. And our uh, next panelist is uh, Subhashri, Subhashri Krishna Swami. She is a writer, translator, editor. She has won uh, Sahitya Academy Translation Prize in, for 2018 uh, for her translation of the critically acclaimed the Tamil story through the times, through the tides, edited by Dilip Kumar. It's a mammoth anthology of Tamil short fiction translated into English. She has edited Indian uh, review of books, monthly magazine, devoted review of books for a number of years. Uh, her book, uh, The Babel Guide to South Indian Fiction in Translation, was published by Babel Books, United Kingdom. She has edited and translated anthology of Tamil poetry, Rapids of uh, Great River, along with uh, Lakshmi Hamstrom and K. Sri Lata. She has collaborated with Sri Lata on the book, Short Fiction from South India, which is published by OUP. Uh, she won the BBC Short Story Award in 2005. She has been a judge of Crossword Awards for several years. She is an adjunct professor at the Asian College of Journalism. Oh, well, it's great to have you here with us, ma'am. Thank you so much, sir. Happy to and, be here. Uh, uh, happy to time. meet all of you. Yeah. Uh, and the same, same with us and all of us are very happy to see you. And Professor Deepak Kumar Sharma, he is serving uh, in Kumar, Bhaskar, Verma, Sanskrit and Ancient Studies, University, Nalbari, Assam, as a first vice chancellor for the last nine years. He was a professor of Sanskrit and served as director, College of Development Council at Guwahati University before he became vice chancellor. He has authored and translated and edited 17 books in English, Sanskrit and Assamese. Uh, he has about 50 research papers and more than 150 articles published in journals and newspapers. He contributes satirical write-ups in Assamese under different name. Professor Sharma received translation award in Sanskrit Sahitya Academy's Translation Prize, same year in which Subhashri won uh, for his uh, <clears throat> Asma, I don't know <laughs> how to pronounce that, uh, Bang Manjari, I guess I got it correct, anthology of actually uh, 100 uh, Assamese poems of 65 poets translated into Sanskrit. Actually, I went through the book, it's a fantastic collection. And uh, well, it has be, it's a great honor to have you with us, sir today. Thank you. So, okay. So now uh, we will go with Dr. Bikram Das and we have a very distinguished panel, great minds. We have a very limited time. The topic is vast. Let's see how far we can address all the issues. We will start with uh, Dr. Bikram Das. Uh, on, I mean, his opening remarks, each panelist will get two minutes each. Uh, on the role of translation in acquisition of knowledge. Dr. Vikram Das. Thank you, Mr. Rajmohan. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, since the theme is translation and uh, knowledge acquisition, I suppose one is expected to say that translation has an important role to play in the acquisition of knowledge. Unfortunately, I'm not able to make that statement. Okay. See, because there are different kinds of books, different kinds of translations, different kinds of knowledge, and it all depends on you know what the circumstances are. If you if you're going to look for knowledge acquisition in, in translated books, in translated material. Uh, I don't know how true it is to say that. Uh, translation can, in fact, provide knowledge. You see, I suppose it's very fashionable at the present time when you are saying that uh, you know India is the fountainhead of all ancient knowledge. Since we are the people who have the old books, uh, 
we must have got this from translation. But I am I'm sure this is not correct. Now, you see, my primary profession is not that of a translator, yeah. but a, a language teacher, actually. That is what I am. And uh, for me, knowledge acquisition is synonymous with language acquisition. Okay. In, the, in the first five or 10 years of his life, the child, whatever the child learns, is language. It, it is through language that the child is learning about the world. But this is not translated language. That is the unfortunate part. Is it? Okay. I mean, as, as a language teacher, I'm very happy about a new language policy which is at last decided that children should be educated through the mother tongue medium and not mm. through a foreign language like English. Okay. Because I myself, although I went to an English medium school and whatever I've learned today is largely through English, through the English language. And many of the books which I read, I suspect were translated books. And let me tell you straight away that I think that the language which I derived from, from these books is largely derivative. As an Indian, I'm ashamed of the fact that most of our thinking is imitative, derivative, mm -hmm. and second rate. This is because we do not think in the mother tongue, in our own languages. Uh, as a child, I was very happy to when people praised me for my good English. Although I, I, I learned to speak my mother tongue in Odia at the age of 25. At the, until then, I had not been exposed to my own language. I had been born and brought up in a different place. So anyway, uh, I mean, translation can be used for many purposes. Mm -hmm. But I would say that for me as a translator, the only reason why I choose to translate is because I enjoy translating. Okay. To me, translation is the only form of creation, creativity that I can claim. Okay. Yeah, I'm not a writer, I'm not a poet. Mm -hmm. So the only translation, the only creativity that I can achieve is through translation. Okay. And it, uh, it saddens me very much when I am told that a translator cannot afford to be creative. Okay. Uh, a very prominent writer who writes in two languages, the bilingual writer, there are not too many of them around, uh, he very emphatically stated once that the translator has no right to be creative. His job is to faithfully capture the essence of what the writer has tried to write in his own book. Although I, am, I must say, I'm not to this date, even 40 years later or 50 years later, I have not, I have not understood exactly what it is that we expect the translator to be faithful to. We always say that, that translation must be faithful, but faithful to what? Faithful to language? faithful to the spirit, whatever that means, okay. the spirit of the book, and so on. Okay. So, yes, I suppose it's possible to get educated, get to get knowledge through translation, but that is not its primary function. That is not its primary role, you see. Okay. Translate, as I've said, is a form of creativity, mm -hmm. and it is what opens Okay. The joy of creation. The joy. And in another case, I, I would like to just close with one more observation. Mm -hmm. Translations has helped me to discover my own culture. It has helped me to discover in that sense my myself. You see, because as I yeah. just said, until the age of 25, I did not, I was not able to read or write Odia. Okay. I could speak it. I, I, I made a mistake when I said I, I couldn't speak it. I could. So I have discovered myself, I've discovered my cultural roots through translation. So that certainly is a very positive thing that translation has done for me. 
But that's about all I can say for translation. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And that's one perspective. Professor Sorabi Banerjee? Your thoughts yes. on the theme. Your uh, thoughts on the theme. Well, let me admit at the outset that yes, I'm on the on the theme. Uh, speaking on the theme itself, and uh, I uh, should admit at the outset that I'm rather daunted by the vastness of the topic under yeah. discussion today. Yeah. It's a vast topic. It's a mammoth topic. It's a wide umbrella, and uh, needless to say that translation does play. Uh, a significantly affirmative role in the acquisition of knowledge, right? But yeah. then, uh, knowledge is a many-layered concept, and so is translation. Translation mm. is also a, a heavily laden with uh, multiple shades and nuances. Mm -hmm. so, therefore, I, I think our endeavor to define or even describe the mode and trajectory of learning or acquisition of knowledge or transmission of knowledge through translation becomes a massive and onerous exercise and which I, I think actually, I mean, ultimately glides into the arena of translation studies. These are my introductory remarks. Yeah. And I should refer to uh, uh, Professor Das's uh, points on the faithfulness of the original and faithfulness of the translated text to the original and also his discovery of cultural roots, you know, reading translations, say, Oriya at uh, in, in, in late age and so on. Yeah, that, uh, that is a topic we will, oh, okay, next round, ma'am, next or second or third round. And uh, okay. uh, Mini Krishna, your opening remarks. The joker in this pack. Uh, I've translated very little and mostly for myself and my friends. Um, the contact of cultures has always been the point which brings about progress. And uh, the transfer of knowledge, whether it is to do with medicine or uh, engineering or astronomy, mathematics, uh, has always been through this contact and the transfer through languages. So. There is that level of transfer of knowledge. It's a kind of power line. As it seeps down um, into university levels and into schools, it takes on different forms. At one time in schools, we were encouraged, at least orally, uh, to translate from the second language text, just two or three lines. Or we were asked, uh, in your language, how would you put this? A certain bilinguality was encouraged. That's in schools. And that's where Bikram was talking about language acquisition. I think the big problem is that we're not uh, allowing the bilinguality to grow. And that has damaged at least two generations of, of Indians. I'm talking about our context. I don't want to talk about something I'm not familiar with. So the, I mean, everyone knows that the more languages you know, uh, the more nimble your mind will be and more capable of handling complex ideas and understanding the other person. And that is actually the point. Even those who are not literate, uh, but who might know two languages, you know, people who live in these, uh, these border regions uh, between two states, they very frequently move from one language into another. Uh, and they express themselves actually very well. So the two or three points, transfer of knowledge, acquisition of language, uh, the two are definitely linked. But, and to come back to Vikram's point of creativity, uh, talking about publishing, we'll do it later. A translator has to be as creative as the writer, if not more creative, because you mm. have to carry uh, somebody yeah. else's hands. I want to just give you a single quote, which I wrote down. Uh, actually, someone said it about the Tirukural, seeing the aphoristic power of that. He said, um, uh, and then Ambai used it later when she, said she was, when she was working with Lakshmi Holmstrom. We miss her even today. She said, translation is like uh, pushing seven oceans through a mustard seed. She said that is how difficult and how forceful a translation can be. 
So I will come back to other points later, but these okay. are three things I just wanted to okay. set them. Okay, thank you. What are we going uh, to do about it? What are we yeah, going to do about it? Yeah, and uh, pushing seven oceans into the mustard sea. Uh, right. Dev Shankar Navinji. Uh, unmute kar dijiye. Unmute kar dijiye, please. Please unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you. थैंक यू मैं अपनी बात शुरू करने से सबको नमस्ते और शुरू करने से पहले एक वाक्य प्रोफेसर विक्रम दास जी की तरफ जाना चाहता हूं उन्होंने कहा कि मैं अनुवादक हूं मैं लेखक नहीं हूं अनुवादक को मैं सभी से यह दरखास्त करना चाहूंगा कि अनुवादक को तो मैं वैसा महात्मा मानता हूं लेखक तो अपनी बात लिखते हैं लेकिन अनुवादक ऐसे महात्मा है जो दूसरों की बात को उसी अर्थ में दूसरी भाषा में पहुंचाने का काम करते हैं इसलिए अनुवादक का काम महान है जहां तक एक्विजिशन ऑफ नॉलेज की बात है मित्रों मैं ये देखता हूं कि अनुवाद का सीधा रिश्ता भाषा से है और जैसा कह रही थी सुरभि जी और ये थोड़ा सा इशारा मिनी जी ने भी किया कि अनुवाद ज्ञान के प्रसार में और ज्ञान ग्रहण करने के रास्ते में एकमात्र रास्ता तो अनुवाद नहीं है किंतु एक बड़ा रास्ता जरूर है क्योंकि इसी के माध्यम से भारत जैसे बहुभाषी बहुसांस्कृतिक देश में और इस समय जबकि हम पूरी दुनिया से मुखातिब हैं तो यह और भी बढ़ गया है और ज्ञान के एक्विजिशन एक्विजिशन में भार ज्ञान अर्जन करने की दिशा में भारत वैदिक काल से ही इस प्रथा को विकास देता रहा है और पूरा वेदांत साहित्य तब तक भी हम जाएंगे तो वह पूरे वैदिक साहित्य का अनुवाद है और उसके बाद जितने जितनी तरह के अनु उसके भाष्य और टीकाएं हमारे सामने आती रही हैं आज के समय में जब हम देख रहे हैं कि जब दुनिया के सारे आ, सारी पद्धतियों से हम अवगत होना चाहते हैं तो अनुवाद के बिना ये ज्ञान का प्रसार भाषाई तौर पर है और नोइंग दो मेनी लैंग्वेजेस तो भाषा की अनभिज्ञता के कारण ज्ञान यदि किसी दूसरी भाषा में उपजा है तो उस उपज वह उपज हमारी भाषा में भी महत्वपूर्ण हो और हमारी भाषा के लोग जाने ये अनुवाद के बिना असंभव है आज हम समुतिरम को सुसमुतिरम को या पुनतिल कुंज अब्दुल्ला को या युवानंद मूर्ति को या महाश्वेता देवी को हर किसी को बंगला तमिल तेलुगु मलयालम जाने बगैर हम आज आदि कवि शरला दास को पढ़ रहे हैं और समझ रहे हैं फकीर मोहन सेनापति को जान रहे हैं समझ रहे हैं तो यह अनुवाद के बिना असंभव था इसलिए ज्ञान के एक्विजिशन में अनुवाद सब कुछ बेशक नहीं हो लेकिन बहुत कुछ है और अनुवाद की जरूरत ज्ञानार्जन के लिए आज के समय में आवश्यक है और इसकी आवश्यकता जब कभी हुई थी उस समय तो केवल ये संप्रेषण एक्सचेंज ऑफ थाउट्स के लिए हुई थी लेकिन hmm. आज हमारे जीवन में अनुवाद सांस सांस की जरूरत है अभी okay. तो इतना ही फिर आगे हम लोग बात करेंगे Uh, namaskar yeah so the topic has been rightly chosen and a very important one uh, thank you dr rajmohan ji uh, yeah. so uh, now we are talking with those people who are in academics now most of the people here are in academics so we are talking about this uh, knowledge sensory 21st century is a knowledge sensory it is often said uh, everybody knows and uh, yes knowledge is something unique and there are all so many branches of knowledge constitute what we call it is, therefore it is unique uh, uh. so so 
Yes, I fully endorse um, Dr. Devashankar's De uh, opinion that uh, translation is not the only vehicle for contribution or generation or dissemination of knowledge. It's not the only vehicle, but it plays a very important role. For example, in our notice, I, I am from Assam, as you know. Uh, I'm from Assam, and in the entire notice, there are 272 languages spoken here yeah. today. 272. And all the languages have their own culture. All the languages can start something significant so far knowledge is concerned. If we don't understand what is written, what is spoken in those languages, how can we, we can have a proper idea of not to speak of India as a whole? Uh, so in a country like ours, Translation plays a very important role. And as you know, uh, that um, in Assam, in Assam's literature started with the translation of Madhav Pandali's Ramayana in, uh, by Val Madhav Pandali, uh, Valmiki's Ramayana by Madhav Pandali. It was in 11th century after Tamil. Tamil version was the first in Indian languages. Uh, and it was second in Assam, Assamese language. So, uh, whether our state is concerned or not, is concerned, and our India is concerned, translation is very much important. And um, uh, translation plays a very, very important and significant role because transmitting the ideas, transmitting the, I mean, the contents of one language, of, the, of, of a book in one language, it is very, uh, very important role. Yeah. And uh, you see, and these are, uh, now you see in India so many texts on various branches of knowledge like mathematics, pure and applied sciences, uh, humanities. You know, those books were written in Sanskrit, and some of the books are translated into many languages. But there is there is some sort of I mean gap as a result of which we are yet to yet to mm -hmm. make proper use of the knowledge stored in our ancient texts. The translation okay. can play an important play an important role uh, for re-understanding our past so that we can assess our present and prepare for the future. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So much. Yeah. Um, first of all, I mean, what is language? Yeah. Um, language is uh, something which informs a person's identity, right? And it is the repository of the person's heritage, written and uh, oral. And as someone said, I don't remember who it was, but I thought it was a really wonderful line. Language is the permanent address of a person. Now, um, you know, India is a diverse country and then, you know, we have so many languages and of course we can all learn each other's languages, but translation also played a really big part in our interactions. And so many of our books have traveled, especially something like the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, we have in every language. Now, I like to think that translation is uh, actually the meeting point between cultures, where an idea from one culture makes its way into another. And uh, I'll tell you how um, you know, um, it um, works. And it makes its way in a really important level, and that is in the language. And today, where we live in a you know, globalized uh, setup, I think a language which doesn't lend or borrow would might find itself uh, extinct even. So I'm going to start with a, you know, my personal experience of translating this book, which is actually a collection of uh, 88 stories. It's an anthology. So it actually traces the evolution of the Tamil short story in uh, English. And um, you know, from the early decades of the 20th century to the 2000. So actually, um, the modern short story as we know it today is actually an import from the West. And our forefathers who knew English, who had mastered English, had read it first in English. And a few of them had even translated into the languages they knew. So, you know, so we really got this form, this genre actually, it's only because of translations. And I mm. think it was the Bengalis who picked it up first. And I think Bharatiya actually read uh, Tagore in translation. And then there was really an informed debate in Tamil as to how 
to use this wonderful medium to express their complexities and their struggles um, in life. So, uh, you know, so the, this is what, uh, you know, sparked off the modern short fiction in Tamil. And, but our, um, you know, ancestors were quite clever. They didn't kind of uh, just take everything from there. They situated it in their own milieu. And then they, which was conditioned by their religious, cultural, and political situations. So in this, uh, you know, it, don't, it can only enrich a language. Such kind of exchanges can only enrich a language. And I'd like to think that even this enrichment is a kind of knowledge, actually. And, you know, now knowledge doesn't necessarily just have to be technological or, you know, the, the field of engineering or education. Even a thing such as this, you can think of it as knowledge. Yeah, thank you. So now all of you made a very important, I mean, all of you touched upon because Dr. Bikram was started with rediscovering his own cultural roots. And of course, uh, Dev Shankar Naveen also talked about it. Mini Krishnan and Subhashri talked about meeting of culture, Professor Sorbi Anjide. So this, from this, I would like to start. Is culture, cultural components translatable? On the one hand, you know, on the, well, let us see the modern contemporary trends where children, let's say Kashmiri children or Malayali children, when they, when they don't, let's assume they don't know English, but when Harry Potter comes, gets translated, they all they get absorbed seamlessly into the world of Harry Potter and also, let's say, Pokemon. It is a different universe. As adults, we all struggle, but children, they just, they thought there is no uh, need for to think about cultural portability at all. See, is culture translatable? That's one question. We will start in the reverse order. For our, first, we'll start with Subhashri, because you I just finished speaking, sir. Let someone else speak and then... Okay, let me... then we'll start with Bikram Das. Dr. Bikram Das. Well, if I may <clears throat> ask for uh, pardon. Yeah. I, I find there is some confusion here between terms. Are we confusing knowledge with literature or knowledge with culture? And are we confusing translation with bilingualism or, monoly or multilingualism? You see, now I, I started by saying that there are different kinds of knowledge, but I found that most of the examples of knowledge that were given today by the speakers, Tirukural was quoted, Ramayan was quoted, every example was from literature. Now it's true that you, you do get a kind of knowledge from literature, but how do you define knowledge? Now, I think that what is most relevant to our age, since we're talking about cultural paradigms and so on. Yeah. In the cultural paradigm that we are living in today, the most relevant kind of knowledge, surely, is what we can call scientific knowledge. You see? Now, without scientific knowledge, we would go and make statements such as, India had plastic surgery 10,000 years ago, and so on. That also is knowledge of a kind, you see? But I think you would be better off without that kind of knowledge. Uh, now, if you're talking about knowledge transformation, not knowledge transmission or knowledge uh, acquisition, this is best done. I mean, there is, there is plenty of psycholinguistic evidence to show this. This is best done in the language of the, of the learner. A Malayali child or a Tamil child will learn science best through his own language, not through English. And the fact that our IITs in India are only doing imitative research. There is very little original research that comes out of the IITs. And the reason is that all the, all the people who come to the IITs are, most of them have come from the English medium education. So that's one thing. Do we are, we are we talking about what kind of knowledge are we talking about? Is it scientific, rational knowledge, or is it intuitive knowledge? They are two different things, completely different things. Intuitive knowledge and translation certainly can and do go together. You see? 
whatever I've learned about Gopinath Mahanti's characters and, and the world that he creates is through translation. But this is all intuition, all intuitive. I mean, Gopinath Mahanti didn't know the language that he was writing in. He was the language of people that he was writing about. He had to learn it. So uh, that's one thing, you know. If it is knowledge in the true sense or in the, in the scientific sense, then translation can only play a secondary role. You see, if, if you ever go to the Central Institute of Indian Languages in Mysore, there is a project which has been going on there for the last, what, 25 years maybe. They're trying to translate books, what they call knowledge texts, from other languages into English. And no publisher wants to touch those books. They're so bad. See? They're of such poor quality. Because the people who are writing, they have no background in knowledge, uh, in science. They don't know what they're writing about. But because they have to be translated from into the uh, Indian languages. So, that's just, so let, let's be, I mean, I think we're being unnecessarily chauvinistic. Everything that exists came from India. We are the fountainhead from which all knowledge came. Sanskrit is the mother of all languages. So everything it goes back to the Vedas. Okay. That's fine. And the other thing that I, I often object to is, you see, in the English-speaking world, the Anglo-Saxon world, you will find very few bilingual people. Because they want everything to be translated into their language, English. For, their, for them, this is the only language that matters. So they, they, they have avoided learning other languages. Do we want to make that our model? I mean, do, do we want to block the growth of, of other languages? Because if, if you translate, you, you are tempted not to learn the language the, from which it has been translated in the, in the original. So I would say to some extent, translation and bilingualism or multilingualism uh, are mutually sort of antagonistic to some extent. So we have to be careful about that also. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. Let's, let's define our terms very carefully. That's yes, I mean, yes. yes, sir. Both of them, both uh, uh, Dev Shankar Naveenji and uh, Deepak Kumar Sharma also talked about this is not the only vehicle. Translation is not the only vehicle. It's one of the important vehicles for transmission of knowledge and acquisition of knowledge. And I, I, started, I started with the example of Principia Mathematica of Newton and the works of Einstein, and of course in literature. I mean, like um, these are like without whatever we are today, sir, whatever we are today, the technology we are using, the rockets which are flying, Everything has related to that four fundamental laws which Newton discovered and he put it in a book after 15 years. That book got translated into worldwide. And of course, in Tamil, I have read those books. In Malayali children, they, have read, they must be reading. In Assamese, they will be reading. So that way, we asked that question that way. Knowledge is multiple. The way in which acquisition of knowledge, pramana, is also multiple. So I'm not saying that only there are six ways of knowing, six ways of knowing is there in Indian epistemology. Exactly. No, I'm just telling there could be multiple ways. So no, that's the point I'm trying to make. Yeah, yes, sir, yes, sir. There are yeah. different kinds of knowledge. Yeah, correct, sir. We, we cannot equate all yeah, of them. Correct, correct. So well, no, that is a point well taken, but uh, all of you mentioned only one thing, sir. That is, which is common is, uh, you, you started with uh, starting about uh, discovering cultural roots. And all of you, they believe people talked about merger of meeting points of culture. That's where translation come into play. Very true, especially in a multilingual society. So my only question, a single line question is, is culture, cultural components translatable? Dr. Bikram Das. That's only if, question. Very quick. If, if it was not translatable, we wouldn't have translation. Okay, okay. Thank you, sir. And uh, uh, Professor Dev Shankar Naveen. मैं इस बात से पूरी तरह सहमत हूं कि जो बाल शिक्षा की व्यवस्था है उसमें यदि मातृभाषा में पढ़ाई जाए 
नॉलेज टेक्स्ट मातृभाषा में पढ़ाई जाए तो वो जल्दी जल्दी उसे ग्रहण करेगा एक मैथिल बच्चा अमरूद या ग्वारा बहुत देर से समझता है लेकिन लताम कहते ही वह उसे एक्सेप्ट कर लेता है यहाँ तक तो सहमति है लेकिन जहाँ संस्कृति की बात है तो यदि अनुवाद नहीं हुआ होता तो मलयालम भाषी क्षेत्र में लिटरेचर के अनुवाद के कारण ही संस्कृति का अनुवाद होता है और मेरे मैथिल प्रदेश में साली और जीजा का रिश्ता हास परिहास का होता है थोड़ा उष्मा वाला हास परिहास का लेकिन मलयालम भाषी क्षेत्र में साली अपने जीजा को ठीक वैसा रेस्पेक्ट देती है जैसा वह अपने सहोदर बड़े भाई को देती है तो ये संस्कृति में इसकी जरूरत भी है और ऐसे मलयालम का उपन्यास या मलयालम की कोई कहानी इस संदर्भ के साथ यदि मैथिली में अनुवाद हो तो वहां जरूरी नहीं हो है कि वहां उस मलयालम की साली को मिथिलांचल की साली बना दिया जाए वहां जरूरी है कि इस संदर्भ को बता दिया जाए कि ऐसा हो सकता है और ये मिथिलांचल में ऐसे बिहार में ही कई सारे क्षेत्र हैं जहां पर ब्राह्मण जाति के लोग क्षमा कीजिएगा मैं जाति का इस्तेमाल उस तरह नहीं कर रहा हूं पर ब्राह्मण जाति के कई लोग उसको मांसाहार वर्जित है लेकिन मिथिलांचल के ब्राह्मण लोग के लिए मांसाहार उसका रिचुअल है तो ये संस्कृति के अनुवाद में तो सबसे इतनी बड़ी समस्या आई थी सहंसा अकबर के समय में जब महाभारत और रामायण के अनुवाद की बात आई थी तो एक बहुदेवो पासना वाली किताब अब उसका अनुवाद जब फारसी में होना था तो वहां एक देवो पासना वाला वाली भाषा है अब यहाँ पर शंकर भी देवता हैं गणेश भी देवता हैं राम भी देवता हैं और बीच में और भी हिंदू धर्म के अनुसार हिंदू धर्म में तो धर्म की भी एक श्रृंखला है और किस किस तरह से धार्मिक भावनाएं आई हैं उन सब चीजों को एक देवोपासना में अनुवाद करते समय जो अनट्रांसलेटेबिलिटी अनुवाद्यता आएगी तो संस्कृति के अनुवाद में जो भी बाधाएं हैं उससे पार जाने के लिए हमारे विद्वानों ने अनट्रांसलेटेबिलिटी शब्द के फुटनोट की व्यवस्था से इन सभी समस्याओं से हमें मुक्त कर दिया है और अनुवाद जरूरी है अनुवाद को खू, का खूंटा पकड़ के उसमें किसी तरह के कि दृढ़ता के कारण हम अनुवाद जैसी एक भव्य व्यवस्था को जो हमारे मानव सभ्यता के शुरुआती समय से चली आ रही है और आज हमारे जीवन की जरूरत है Okay. जिस भाषा की बात शुभश्री कर रही थी तो भाषा में तो ये सारी बातें भा, भाषा तो अपने अपने जनपद की संस्कृति के साथ चलती है भाषा उत्पन्न ही होती है कामगारों के बीच में वर्किंग पीपल के बीच में और वहीं पर वह मान्यता पाती है और वहीं से संस्कृति में घुसकर मनुष्य को वह डिसिप्लिन करना शुरू कर देती है मनुष्य से पैदा हुई भाषा मनुष्य पर ही शासन कर लेती है और करने लगती है तो इस प्रक्रिया में हमें थोड़ा लचीला भी होना चाहिए ओके या दैट्स अ वेरी गुड पॉइंट एंड इनफैक्ट प्रोफेसर सोरबी बैनर्जी यस इस आई थिंक कल्चर ट्रांसलेटेबल यस इट इज ट्रांसलेटेबल ओके एंड इट इज नॉट टोटली अनट्रांसलेटेबल बिकॉज़ आई थिंक दैट यू नो आई मीन आई थिंक आई वुड लाइक टू पार्ट विद अ सॉर्ट ऑफ Uh, one of the rudimentary aspects of translation mm -hmm. right? it may sound rather naive at this stage but all said and done you know without going into the maze of classical and postmodern theories of translation i'd say the moot point about translation is an act i deliberately use the word act mm -hmm. because it is an action you all know that of carrying over translation you are transferring something from one location to another another location from one culture to another culture from one uh, you know context to another context so yes sometimes they are not quite translatable i can give you some examples you know from my own experience uh, when i was translating uh, flaubert uh, you know from french into bengali 
there were so many, and Flaubert was well known for his very meticulous choice of uh, words. Not only just the more just one, the right word, but one word, one unique word. There's no substitute for that word, for that particular expression. So it is very difficult, and it was strewn with uh, uh, typically provincial, regional, uh, indigenous uh, words, which were very difficult to translate. So I had, uh, you know, this posed great problems for me. And uh, so how do you manage that? I can give you one example from one English translation of nonsense rhymes. You know, the, in English, it is used, the word is used Stilton cheese. That is uh, an English cheese, uh, Stilton of Stilton, the brand is called Stilton. But the translator, while translating it into Bengali, is, he has made it Dhakai Bakor Khani. <laughs> that is homemade yeah. with yeah, yeah, I get it. Yeah. dish. Yes, so the, 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 the reader, you know, in a, in a, from a different region will be able to um, identify, able to relate to that particular, uh, you know, Dhakai Bakor Khani rather than to, which, is, which sounds rather alien, uh, this, uh, um, uh, this uh, silk and cheese. So uh, these are, you know, there are numerous such instances of a kind of uh, contextualization of the culture because it is basically an action of transferring, you know, not only the interlingual transfer, it's also the intercultural transfer. And what is needed, whether it's for the acquisition of knowledge or for the transmission of knowledge or creating a knowledge base uh, in a society, I think that if you know the right dynamics of translation, that it is, it is it's an act, it's an action, and while transferring you know, the, the content, the text or the subtext to uh, the uh, target language, if you, if you are conscious, if you are wary, if you are alert, I think that you, you seldom fail to uh, achieve your goal. Okay. So yeah. Uh, thank you. So what uh, Professor Dev Shankar Naveen and uh, uh, Professor Rubi Janaji is telling Anyway, the nothing uh, serious. Okay, we are discussing seriously. Just in between, I just, you know, live in a lighter vein. Maybe late 70s when Doordarshan was just, you know, flourishing, started to flourish. Okay, there are various uh, festivals of India. India has got different religions, cultures, and suddenly government decided, okay, we will um, release one movie. Okay, what is there for Christmas? Okay, there is a movie called Jesus Christ. They translated into Hindi. Okay, first it came to Hindi, then it was, all of you will, will remember that those days it, it came in different languages. Okay, there was a day and then uh, the Jesus Christ was put in chains and taken away. Judas or somebody says the word, use the word bastard. Okay, now, oh my God, that is not compatible to our culture. So one IAS officer saw this and made bastard into hey Bhagwan. So uh, the, when, the, when the culture gets me now, how, when they say untranslatability also could mean political. Yeah, okay. So many questions. Sorry. Sorry to budge in there. I, I will tell you, I will tell you, I will tell you why uh, I connected the first question, knowledge acquisition with the, because all of, not only because all of you touched upon culture, cultural roots. So I, I will tell you after we'll finish with all of you. Mini Kristen, sorry. Thank you. Yes, I, I can also give um, one or two examples like this. One was um, in Karnataka when they were 2000, no, no, sorry, uh, 1910 or 1911. They translated Romeo and Juliet into Canada. It was being performed. And um, the audience did not like the tragic ending. So they took a procession to the writer's translator's house and said, you have to change this ending. So the next performance, Lord Vishnu appears and brings Romeo and Juliet back to life. Because he said, in our uh, tradition, in our uh, system, <laughs> we can't have such a tragic ending, such two young people. So there's one like that. And that's just one example, historical. The other is my own example where I didn't know. See, I've never lived in Kerala, though I'm a Malayali, and learned to read Malayalam very late, like Vikram did his language. Um, I was editing the anthology of Malayalam Dalit writing some 10 years ago. And uh, apparently the edits I made were so uh, acceptable that one of the contributors, S. Joseph, sent me his poem and said, 
uh, somebody else had translated. He said, can you translate this? So I was very happy and I translated it. There's one point where he says, um, it's called mainstream. He says, um, I'll, um, I'll meet you in the shop, in the shop. Shop, I thought, because there's, a, there's an indication that it's the toddy shop. So I translated it as toddy shop. I thought it's fine for English. And Dr. Thomas told me, AJ Thomas told me, see in Malayalam when they say shop, it's understood that it's a toddy shop. Yeah. You don't have to say shop. Shop is toddy shop. But I didn't know that because I've never lived there. If I had lived in Kerala, I would have known that shop means toddy shop. So these two examples, um, I can give you my, the one culture will not accept it. And in, in my instance, pure ignorance of my own culture. Um, I think this is also one of the reasons, see we often ask each other uh, this rhetorical question to which we actually know the answer. Why is it that our, our books don't travel all around the world, you know, all around the world in 80 days? Um, a certain quality of expertise, uh, uh, let's say, um, or the um, special knowledge really is required to understand a much older and much more layered culture, um, much more complex culture, let me put it that way. So it's also the reason, and this is a, a point I'd like to bring up, because again, it's connected with knowledge, with uh, mm -hmm. transfer and, tra and translation yeah. and creativity. The kind of books that do get accepted in different parts of the world, uh, those books where you know the, the reader is very comfortable, he doesn't have to make much of an effort to understand those books. And this in turn, and in publishing is a very dangerous trend, this in turn is influencing uh, the kind of books that publishers seek to submit uh, for these huge prizes. And take one more step back, this in turn influences decisions of what publishers are regarding the decisions publishers take about what books to translate. This is, in my opinion, a very sinister trend because uh, it means that you are going to omit uh, certain older texts and older writers who don't fit that, uh, that framework. So I'd like some sort of discussion on this. So at least I'm just going to put this thought across for whoever yeah, watches yeah. this. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Professor Deepak Kumar Sharma. So whatever you talk about uh, the culture, 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 thing, uh, yeah, translation, translation of culture. Yeah. So whether the culture is it is a translatable or not, that is the question. Yes. Yeah, so uh, you know we know that the translators are often carrying the stigma uh, that translators are traitors. One of the reasons for this is that sometimes. The translator, translator fails in carrying, uh, transmitting the cultural components embedded in one piece of literature. So, but uh, but uh, when it is, as I told to mention at the beginning, that uh, translators play a very important and significant role because he is not translating or trans, I mean, uh, bringing one the sentences to, and rendering the sentences from one language to another. He is not retelling the stories only, but he is transmitting the culture. So it is a very serious job. And uh, what happens as uh, Professor Suraviji told that um, once I had the experience of uh, going to the manuscript of a novel of an established service writer. Uh, there is saw the phrase, Punar Samus Loi Janma, that means born with a silver spoon. Okay. Born with a silver spoon in Assam, in Assamese society, not only in Assam, in Indian society, the child is not born with a silver spoon. It is borrowed from West. It is borrowed from us, but in Assamese literature or also in, in many regional languages, as I know, that we use the phrase. 
meaning that he, uh, he was born rich. To, to mean that, we just say that he was born with a silver spoon. But this is not Indian context. Similarly, uh, as, as Professor Devashankar said that uh, we know Anandamurti, you are Anandamurti, we know Ashapurina Devi, not that, that we don't, it is not uh, confined to the story only, but we know the background, we know the culture. As I took mention earlier, that uh, the Balmiki Ramayana was translated into Assamese in the first 11th century. So Assam, the North, one of the northeastern states of India, is connected to the mainland of India through cultural, I mean, cultural I mean, transmission or intentions through this Ramayana. So yeah. uh, surely, yes, it's a okay. very difficult job, very difficult. It is a challenge or threat rather to the yeah. translator. But uh, the, the, the success or otherwise of a good translator lies in how far he or she is able to, uh, I mean, bringing the cultural components of a particular piece of writing into the, the target place. Okay. Okay. So, Vashri? Yeah. Um, I think uh, most translators would try to translate because, uh, you know, actually most translators also work on the premise that something is going to be lost but how best to salvage um, what is there, you know? So we all try and primarily, actually, um, I think uh, me and I, I think a few others I know, we translate actually for other Indians. So yeah. most Indians, we share so many things and they will get it, you know? And uh, if you think that they uh, don't get it, I mean, there are certain rituals and ceremonies and all that, you know, which are very, very particular to each community and uh, language. But then you find the same things in other languages too. So I think most readers will get it. And if they don't, you can always have a glossary in the end, which kind of explains, but glossary is another topic which we should um, yeah. discuss. Yeah. yeah. So I do think, yes, most of us do try to, okay. um, you know, yeah. Most of us do try. Okay, why I connected first question? First question is related to the second one. But why I asked was I want to bring two examples, two famous examples, both from the well, okay, one from the field of literature, another from actually is a religious book. The first is um, the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. When Ramakrishna Katamrita was translated into English, Nikhilananda took 40 years. 40 years, half a century almost, 40 years to bring this and polish, polish, polish. It, you know, it is completely anglicized. And it also, when, when we read that same Ramakrishna Katamrita from Bengali to Hindi as Vachanamrita, it is, uh, well, it is different from when I read Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. It gives a entirely different feeling. But, it, you know, but the purpose for which he took all the liberty, it is meant for a particular audience, yeah. Western yes. people. He brought millions and millions of millions of people to India. So everybody came in search of Ramakrishna, but they all, they discovered so much of India. And another is uh, that uh, the hundred years of solitude. Gabriel Garcia Marcus. We all did not know. We all thought it's a fidelity was their faithful translation till in five, seven years ago, the translator came to New York Times and said, I'm sorry, I made a lot of changes from the original. I thought that American culture, will, the milieu, cultural milieu will not be able to understand this. I mean, by that, he means so that all the English speaking world will not, European cultures will not be able to understand 100 years of solitude. And he said, I went and met Gabriel Marcus. This is the my translation. So what do you want me to say? I don't think people will accept it. Then Marcus gave him complete liberty to change things. And why I brought this away of this question is because uh, uh, Dr. Bikramda started with what is fidelity, faithfulness. Because the faithfulness, fidelity to the original, especially when it comes to scientific texts. Okay, so you, you know, you have to be there for that, for example, when somebody trying to uh, translate Schrodinger, or for that matter, uh, in, uh, I mean Einstein's, or for that matter, uh, Paul Shu from, uh, say, Chinese or some other translation. I'm not talking about technology, science literature. 
fidelity is very very important but when you as you as uh, professor das said cultural i mean like you know intuitive literature intuitive knowledge so when it comes there it looks like you know more, most of us even uh, dr um, uh, devsharan uh, ravin ji talked about untranslatability so did uh, sorobi banerji so professor uh, deepak kumar sharma ji talked about uh, the various um, adaptations even so uh, even subhashree touched upon that see how far i mean how how much liberty can a translator take i mean like you know it, this is the land for us anuvad even uh, dev shankar navin ji has written he has talked about parampara of hindi parampara anuvad he himself uh, like when i say that professor uh, dev shankar navin ji has written about hindi uh, anuvad parampara here the word anuvad it is not a mere tra- i mean just you know they talking about this india is a land for example if you say 1000 years ago that is ramayana mahabharata we had so many variations like many krishna said they adapted to the local cultural milieu here anuvad is not merely one to one well both you are both i mean contradictory i don't know see the lib- how much liberty can a translator take whether it is in science literature or educational literature or in uh, intuitive literature it is start with mini krishna how much liberty can i translate like you know, for example there is a word a a w e a well i am my mother tongue is tamil i don't know whether malayalam uh, it exists uh, there is a direct translation is because one one uh, one uh, writer came to me i am struggling for two months how will i translate a so i said i don't know there are uh, like professor navin and uh, um, professor surabhi banerji also pointed out untranslatability so how much liberty a translator because as all of you pointed out that na- translation does bring a new knowledge to our doorstep to our life we'll start with uh, mini krishna having handled so many translators um, it's a great deal is to do with uh, the honesty and the respect with which a translator approaches a text and um, like subhashree said at the heart of all translation we know is a kind of failure but you know sometimes i would say that the translation takes on a you see it has the force of two languages it takes on a a power a radiance that sometimes it even outshines the i'm talking only about literature uh the original it goes a bit further so you know you after a point you can't really control that force because it is uh though they talk about the translators invisibility it should be a shadow this that you cannot be a shadow or you cannot be invisible when you are being so creative and that creativity definitely uh will call for improvisations and um, uh, alterations if necessary in order to get not the language but the intent you see the intent has okay. to come through okay and i think there many people will make sacrifices i don't want to go into examples because that will be too complicated but um, uh, the other thing which i'd like to say here is there are so many situations in an original text which are you know things are left unsaid for the indian audience it would be understood bikram and i have had a problem where uh, in uh, danapani there's a situation where uh, a woman willingly married woman willingly garlands or the chief guest in public now we know that a garlanding of a woman and a man in public is a symbol of a wedding is a marriage i think and uh, the author just leaves it like that but those who do not know the culture won't know why there is a shocked silence there we had a problem with that so there's that and there is also for instance uh, the sarcastic saying you know in malayalam there is hmm. so the, <laughs> one uh, very very important crucial point in a novel there was this wife actually this uh, man has homosexual tendencies and he's talking to his friend and suddenly they both look up and realize that the wife is there and she says hmm. it, it comes through in malayalam how to translate it so at that point the uh, translator 
actually had to add a couple of lines. Okay. Okay. So of course you have to, okay. in order to jump that fence, you have to do all sorts of things. Professor Sorebi Banerjee. Well, I think it's very interesting. I think that uh, this is a very uh, uh, interesting as well as a dangerous area. Yeah, okay, I know that. Yes. I know that it's a dangerous area. Yeah, please go ahead. Hmm. Dangerous area because the the uh, when you are uh, translating, uh, say, a scientific treatise or a uh, book on science or a, you know similar books, but I think that the main point is that. Who is translating? The translator, you know, involved in the act of transferring the text to the target language, you know, he, sh he or she should be equipped with the same kind of knowledge that is that should be from the base because otherwise, you know, you would be transferred at all. You know, I, and even the religious texts you talked about, yeah. uh, Ramakrishna, uh, uh, gospel of, you know. But this is this gospel. When I read the gospel, I read it in Bengali. When I read the gospel, you can feel that it was meant for a Western audience. But it is written by a person who was uh, very conversant with their culture, their milieu, their ethos, their likings, and also you know their their acceptability. Similarly, I was reading um, you know recently a, a translation of uh, Tirukural, and I was very disappointed because I, I missed his philosophy. I missed his uh, but I had read an earlier version of Peter Quirrell, uh, much, much, uh, a few years back. And then I found that, you know, there was much, much of that original flavor of, of real Peter Quirrell was there. So what was missing? The missing, I think the translator missed, would lack the knowledge of the background. So this, this knowledge is very important. And particularly in the acquisition of, you know, knowledge, if, if translations play a very significant role in the acquisition of knowledge, in, in broad sense of the term, I think that one should be equipped with that kind of knowledge. And once this knowledge is there, I just remember one statement I, I read in a book that the very act of transfer involves or a potential change. A potential change is naturally embedded in this act of transfer. I mean, this interlingual or intercultural or whatever. Okay. So this should be uh, remembered. And also, one should be very wary about uh, translating um, books and science and other, you know, abstract uh, treatises or books, uh, subjects like philosophy and also cultural studies, linguistics. So, if the if the translator is not equipped that with that domain knowledge, the background, I think that, that the task would be disastrous. Okay, Professor Bikram Das. Yes, uh, thank you. Well, you see, when I set out to translate a book, and I have now translated about a dozen or so, I assume that my translation will be different from the original. I can't prevent that, and I don't want to. Yeah. Because the, the author, he underwent a certain aesthetic experience to which he reacted by producing the original book. My aesthetic experience is the reading of his book. His book. So it's, it's a different source that I'm coming from. So how can my book become the same as the original book written by author? So it's a given. For me, it is a given that what I produce will be different from the original. The question is how much am mm. I allowed to give? Uh, yeah. am I allowed to give it? But this is a question to which I'm afraid there is no answer. I, I have spoken to plenty of translators and I've spoken to, I, I have read all kinds of things on this subject. No one has as yet told me clearly, what is it in the original that you have to preserve? See, you can change everything, but there is something, the X factor, which you cannot change. But what is that X factor? I think today somebody used the word, uh, what, spirit or uh, uh, what, what did Professor Banerjee, what did the word she used? There is something in the original which has to be kept. Flavor. Flavor, flavor. Flavor, flavor. Yeah. There are flavors and flavors. I, I haven't come across a satisfactory explanation of precisely what it is 
in the original that, that defies translation or change. Everything mm -hmm. else can, has, will be changed. But surely there is something. Maybe it is, uh, you can compare this to the skeleton, which is perhaps the plot of the story or whatever, and the flesh, which is which is put on top of the skeleton. The okay. okay. The flesh can change in different ways, but the skeleton cannot change. So this is an, a, 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 a question to which I'm afraid no answer will ever be found. Okay. okay. Yeah, so frames of reference like that frame cannot change. Okay, uh, well, that maybe that is why Cora uh, Tulane Haider, she said translation is an act of creativity. It's a creation. So she did not believe in somebody else translating. So she did what I did was not a translation, trans creation. Oh, um, yeah, and the, when she for the, the sound of falling leaves. And many other works, she herself sat and created. She says, I'm a creator as well as translator. So my work is a trans creation. So she knows what to keep. Anyway, so Professor uh, Dev Shankar Naveen. Unmute, unmute yourself. Unmute, please. आपने सही कहा मिनी जी ने एक बहुत शानदार एग्जाम्पल मलयालम लिटरेचर से शायद उन्होंने दिया था मैं ऐसा ही एक उदाहरण राग दरबारी हिंदी का बहुत ही शानदार उपन्यास है उसमें ये जो रंगनाथ जो उसके नायक हैं वो खद्दर पहन पहने हुए हैं और ट्रक ड्राइवर के साथ जब उन्होंने बैठे और ट्रक ड्राइवर ने जब उससे पूछा कि कर क्या रहे हो और उसने जब कहा कि आ, किसी विश्वविद्यालय में मैं शोध कर रहा हूं तो ड्राइवर ने कहा गोया घास छील रहे हो ये कोट अन कोट घास छील रहे हो थोड़े दू, थोड़ी दूर आगे जाने के बाद जब ट्रक ड्राइवर को डिक्लेयर हो गया कि ये आदमी सीआईडी कहीं का नहीं है सीबीआई में नहीं है तो उसने सीधा पूछा तुम सी में नहीं हो उसने कहा नहीं तो खद्दर क्यों गांठे हुए हो ये जो एक कल्चरल कंटेक्स्ट में जो बनी हुई धारणा है तो जब टेक्स्ट का हम किसी ऐसी भाषा में अनुवाद करना शुरू करेंगे फॉर एग्जांपल अंग्रेजी में जिन्हें ये यूपी बिहार और इधर के इस एरिया का ये सब कल्चर मालूम नहीं है उनको यदि इसी सीबीआई और इसी खद्दर गांठने या आगे शुरू में है कि ट्रेन ने लेट होने के कारण धोखा दे दिया इन सारी चीजों को ये सब ये बिटवीन द वर्ड्स बिटवीन द लेटर्स जो अनट्रांसलेटेबिलिटी है उसको क्लियर किए बिना कोई ट्रांसलेटर आगे नहीं बढ़ सकता आपने जो ये कितनी लिबर्टी की बात की है ये लॉस एंड गेन की व्यवस्था तो अनुवाद में हरदम है सही तो सहमत हुआ जा सकता है विक्रम जी से कि मूल टेक्स्ट की का एग्जैक्ट उसकी आत्मा क्या है और हम किस एक ट्रांसलेटर किस आत्मा की सुरक्षा करें ये सुरक्षा तो जब रश्मि रथी और कुरुक्षेत्र लिख रहे थे दिनकर उन्होंने उसकी मूल आत्मा में कहीं व्यवधान नहीं डाला कोई डिस्टरबेंस नहीं है महाभारत की कथा में और कुरुक्षेत्र में लेकिन उसमें प्रेजेंटेशन ऐसा है कि सेकंड वर्ल्ड वार दिख रहा है प्रेजेंटेशन ऐसा है कि भारत के आगामी पॉलिटिकल और इकोनॉमिक कंडीशन वहां दिखाई दे रहा है तो मूल टेक्स्ट के साथ जो बहुत ज्यादा इतनी दूरी भी ना बढ़ा दी जाए और पुनर्सृजन रिक्रिएशन की स्थिति बनी रहे रचनाशीलता बनी रहे पंजाब हरियाणा के आसपास चादर ओढ़ाना या चुन्नी ओढ़ाना जैसे शब्द की का अर्थ है कि घर में कोई बहू विधवा हो गई है उसको उसके छोटे रिश्ते के कोई पुरुष ने चादर ओढ़ा दिया मतलब बिना शोर शराबे के भीतर शादी हो गई यही चादर ओढ़ाने का यही अर्थ बिहार और उत्तर प्रदेश में नहीं है तो ऐसे ऐसी जगहों पर जब अनुवाद हो रहा होता है 
तो एक अनुवादक का ये दायित्व होता है कि वह ये बहुसांस्कृतिकता और बहुभाषिकता के कारण जो अंतर आने वाला है उस अंतर को वह ध्यान से नोट करे और छूट लेने के क्रम में इतना ना आगे दूर चला जाए कि लेखक से या मूल रचना से उसका कोई रिश्ता ही ना रह जाए और निकट रहने के चक्कर में इतना भी उसमें सटा न रहे कि उसके अर्थ भेद को okay. अर्थान्वेष को खोल न सके ओके सो मेन एनीवे सो टू सॉल्व दिस ओके वी विल आई विल कम टू दैट इन ए प्रोफेसर दीपक कुमार शर्मा सो इट इज अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट पॉइंट द हाउ मच लिबर्टी ए ट्रांसलेटर कैन एंजॉय दैट्स द क्वेश्चन सो यू सी व्हेन एवर ए ट्रांसलेटर बिगिंस आई ही बिगिंस विद सम some kind of sincere love and respect to both lang to two languages the source language as well as the target language so uh, this love and respect i mean guides or controls or regulates him or her so whenever how much liberty he or she will take it depends upon himself or her so it is very subjective and it is as i feel it it comes how a liberty how much liberty he or she will take it depends upon the situations situations okay. so uh, out of contextual necessity uh, the liberty can be uh, to he, he or she can go to a uh, higher extent or whenever it is not necessary he will restrict himself so this is the situation so there is no i don't believe that there is any hard line okay there is in a hard line or any okay uh, parameter but uh, it depends upon the situation or the context okay uh, but uh, this is also a fact that uh, one must be very very careful uh, that uh, the 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 objective is not lost because okay. as you told dr ram rajman that uh, after translation work is done the finish the product it becomes a new creation and the uh, and this new creation is uh, is, a, is targeted to a particular group of readers how much they will be benefited without at not uh, without affecting the uh, meaning or purport or the flavor of the original so okay. it is, so the the The, the liberty the translator is supposed to enjoy it depends upon himself okay. or herself okay. out of in a contextual necessity okay thank you out of contextual necessity uh, subhashree uh, you know basically when you translate what you experience reading the original you want to give the same experience to the reader so you try very very hard to kind of give the reader what you experience so you know whether it's sarcasm or humor or you know disgust whatever it is you try to capture all that for the reader and um, i don't uh, take too many i mean at least as far as i am concerned i don't like to take too many liberties because it's not my original work i try very very hard to uh, you know capture what it is in this instance i have to say that because it was such a huge anthology it was really good working with dilip kumar as the editor because he uh, you know chose the stories and then his english is also so good so he would tell me no i think you have to try harder here you haven't got so it was very useful you know to have somebody as a springboard and uh, you know to constantly uh, tell you and go through every uh, you know line almost yeah okay so i mean actually uh, i mean there is no uh, end uh, like you know for example some of the points which are raised by professor uh, dev shankar nabin and uh, even subhashri talked about it maybe glossary uh, professor nabin said footnotes i mean i don't know the how i mean like there are many things like in uh, meerut and other places uh, uttar pradesh uh, well the, the till well if you go down south till is used for shraddha here it is opposite so when when you I mean i think target audience also matter to great extent to, to whom you are translating to which uh, like prof uh, deepak kumar was referring to uh, as a target language that cultural milieu is is what that shapes 
how much liberty, how much fidelity, faithful. So I'm really, actually, uh, they are gone much, much beyond. Uh, I think Professor Deepak Kumar Sharma told me at least one and a half hours now. Uh, Professor Deepak Kumar, I'm really sorry to keep you. He said 15 minutes and now it's one and a half hours. So should we, because the topic is such a wonderful, fantastic topic, should we continue with more? <laughs> Professor Bikram Das. Now, Professor Deepak, if you want to leave, please, your Vice Chancellor, we don't want to retain you. <laughs> I'm really sorry. It, don't mean it was such a fascinating discussion. It went on and on, and we, we didn't, none of us saw the time also. Professor Bikram Das. Yes, thank you. Well, I think uh, we, have, we generally, I think we have agreed that okay. translation is a creative activity. Yes? Yeah. And the translator, therefore, is more than a stenographer. Okay. He's creating something and he has and therefore a certain measure of liberty yeah. has to be granted to the translator. Okay. Another point I want to make, yeah. which has not been made, is you see, just as the translator has a responsibility towards the reader, I believe the reader also has a responsibility towards the author and the translator. Because one thing we must remember. Not every reader wants to read translation. If you go to a bookshop in an, at an airport or you know at the railway station or somewhere, how many readers will you find picking up a translation in preference to a book which is original? I think it's a very special kind of reader who likes to read translation. He's a reader who can make a transition from one culture to another culture, who enjoys meeting different cultures and so on. See? So this is also something that we have to remember. Yeah. I think we need, we need to educate our readers as well as our translators. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Mini Krishna, you want to say yeah. something? Because we are completely yeah. run out of time. Please, yeah, please Mini Krishna. At this point, you know, at this point, I want to say that unless we take translation education, the study of translation, not translation studies, but just reading translations at least, yeah. and studying them in literature courses, um, in, unless we take it into uh, universities and colleges, schools, of course, it's a completely closed uh, thing, uh, particularly the autonomous colleges, unless that happens, uh, we can't hope for uh, another generation of readers who are uh, who yeah, that is committed. Really, yes. yeah. So, very good, very good, um, very good point. Yeah. We and Sahitya so Academy has a big role to play here. You are the repository of so much, uh, you know, historical in, uh, information yeah. as well as archival. You can yeah. bring publishers together. You can bring academics together, and let the academics tell the publishers. As you see, this is one of the big points here. Yeah. Most publishers don't know enough what to publish, how to you know compile yeah. a sort of canonical list, what to yeah. be useful for academia. That's where translation will live. Yes. You know, we have our writers, we have translators can visit colleges, universities. It should be a movement which you should take yeah. into society. Thank you. Naveen, Naveen ji, Naveen ji, you go very quickly. I don't have to say that Vikram ji is not the same with Vikram ji that he is not the same with Vikram ji that he is not किसी भी भाषा के बड़े से बड़े और छोटे से छोटे लेखक के पाठकों की संख्या स्थगित हो जाने पर पाउज लग जाने पर वह अनुवाद दूसरी भाषाओं के बृहत्तर पाठक तक उसका परिचय पहुंचाता है महाश्वेता देवी पुनतिल कुंज अब्दुल्ला युवा अनंत मूर्ति किसी भी लेखक के किसी भी भाषा के किसी लेखक के लिटरेचर को देख करके तौल लें कि जब उनका अनुवाद दूसरी भाषा में हुआ हिंदी में महाश्वेता देवी की रचनाओं की जितनी प्रतियां बिकी है बंगला में बंगला में यद्यपि बहुत सारे ये परचेजर हैं बहुत सारे पाठक हैं लगभग लोग किताब पढ़ते हैं बावजूद इसके जब दूसरी भाषा में किताब जाती है तो उसका अप्रोच बढ़ता है और उसे खरीदते हैं लोग और अनुवाद ने बहुत कुछ दिया है और विक्रम दास जी जैसे सीनियर और सीजन ट्रांसलेटर को अनुवाद के बारे में थोड़ा सा इतना सालिंता पूर्वक सोचने के बजाय थोड़ा और दृष्टि देखनी चाहिए 
और ये बहुत अच्छा काम हुआ है और ये तो एवर लास्टिंग स्टोरी है Actually, I just wanted to. I mean, I I totally agree with Mini in this respect. Yeah. If you can't just initiate a kind of movement, you know, from the college and university level, and I must, it is. I'm really very optimistic, and I should let you know that for the last 15 years, it is on. The movement is on. You know, in many colleges and uh, universities right. across the across the country, you'll find ancillary departments and ancillary centers for creative writing and translation. or translation studies and also translations translated texts have been included in the curriculum that's all i yeah, thank you so i think we are completely run out of time thank you very much thank you professor dr bikram das thank you mini krishnan thank you subhashree thank you professor navin thank you professor surabhi banerji i'm really sorry professor deepak kumar sharma to keep you waiting for this long i know so many files in between you are signing i saw that so thank you very much thanks all of you and those viewers watching from Thank yeah. you so much Anta, for inviting us. Yeah, thank you. Anta, thank you. Anta, Anta, and I'm really Anta, glad to have met the others. Likewise. Yeah. Bye. Okay. Anta thank Anta you. Rajmohan, I didn't know you're from Tamil Nadu. <laughs> yeah, today you got to know. Yeah. इंटरनेशनल ट्रांसलेशन डे को याद करते हुए आपने साहित्य अकादमी की तरफ से यह आयोजन किया. इसके लिए मैं सभी अपने अपने पैनलिस्ट की तरफ से आप आपका और साहित्य अकादमी का आभार प्रकट करता हूं और आप के कारण इन सब से मिनी जी से पुराना परिचय है बाकी सब से परिचय हुआ आपका बहुत बहुत आभार थैंक यू थैंक यू वेरी मच थैंक्स एवरीवन थैंक यू